Welcome to the Women Waves podcast. Today we've got some amazing women on with us. We've got the lovely Amy Croisdell, who is a stylist, who will be talking to us all about that. We've got Nat Rossetti from the Girls Network, and we've got Dilara, who's also part of the Girls Network. So if we'll, we'll start with you, Amy, if you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've been up to. Hi, I'm a fashion stylist. I work with actresses, musicians, do a bit of editorial um, but mainly kind of red carpet and actresses is my main thing. Um, I have been working, which is incredible. Um, and also I'm a mum to a two-year-old, so kind of balancing that like mumhood and lockdown mm. life and working. Nice. Yeah, it's Amazing. nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And Nat, if you want to tell us a bit about yourself. About the Girls yeah. Network? Yeah, hi, I'm Nat. I'm Head of Communications and Impact at the Girls Network, which is a national charity which aims to inspire and empower teenage girls aged 14 to 19 from the least advantaged communities across England by matching them with a mentor who is a woman and connecting them to a whole network of professional female role models. So I've been with the Girls Network for about five years now. Um, but my background is theatre and spare time is theatre, so it's it's so exciting to be back chatting Aww. with you lovely <laughs> arts ladies. <laughs> it's nice to have you back. Matt, can you yeah. sign me up? I want to help. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll send you, I've got your email now, I've sent, I'll send you everything, everything oh, yes, you need to please. get involved it's amazing after what this. You do. Definitely, it's thank you. And we've also got Delara, who was a mentee at the Girls Network and is now an ambassador. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Delara? So I was on the Girls Network a few years ago and, well, it really helped me, really helped me, I guess, find a path onto the law field, which is what I want to work in in the future. Mm. And, yeah, they've been really amazing um, in helping me find experience um, and so Delara, um, after she was mentored, she, she became part of the ambassador program. And then uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, we, we got this email and it, it was the most eloquent like description <laughs> of when mentoring goes well and has an impact. Like the most beautiful, I hope you don't mind Delara, but I, I'm not going to quote it, but you talked about not only the impact on you, but the impact it had on you to realize what it's like when women support each other mm. and, and the importance of that. And we all basically just like fell off our chairs reading this oh. email um, <laughs> and asked Delara to, to turn the email basically into a blog post because we wanted more. And that's currently on our website um, if yeah. anyone wants to read it. But yeah, she's she's an ama- amazingly, um, yeah, it's we couldn't ask for, for better really as a mentoring charity to get an email like Delara's a few years on particularly to hear that mm. the impact still um yeah, is still affecting her. And and she's actually just had you were saying earlier, Delara, you've just had your last year of school in lockdown, mm. which has got to be one of the most unique experiences. Yeah. Wow. What what was that like? How was that? Yeah, I think it's it's been a bit um more difficult, especially in terms of I guess getting the kind of experiences to apply to unis mm. um, but yeah I think the girls network definitely helped me at least before especially before lockdown mm. and I had loads of amazing things to say and yeah I'm just really in awe of the work they do honestly. Oh I love it. Us too That's... it's amazing what, what you guys do it's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah it really is. How did you find, did you feel like it helped with your confidence? How did it build your confidence? Yeah, definitely. I think um, even my mentor noticed that, like, she noticed at the beginning of the programme, I kind of doubted myself a bit more and hesitated. Mm. And then she really uh, worked with me to kind of build that up and kind of uh, gave me that feeling of, yeah, I can take these chances because I, you know, I deserve this place too. Amy, tell us a bit about uh, your journey into becoming a stylist. It's actually so nice hearing Delara say things like that because 
it takes me back to school when I I didn't even know a stylist existed. Um, I wasn't from London, it's from the countryside. And I guess the accessibility to fashion and media was a lot more diluted than if, well, f experience from talking to friends that brought, were brought up in London, like, very different. Um, and subcultures as well, there wasn't as, you know, it wasn't as diverse. So um, I, it's so nice to hear Delaria say that because you, sometimes you get so, uh, worried about the now and forget about the future and it's amazing to have people kind of tell you like I would you know I wish I could tell more people and I'd love to work with Women's Network you know just tell young girls that you don't you know at school you don't have to fit this format and there are so many amazing opportunities out there mm -hmm. and so for me I think I was really lucky that I fell into well, I was, you know, in an environment at home which w was always just filled with love and you do whatever makes you happy. And so I kind of, I ended up, well, I went to uni and I ended up assisting, um, I assisted Rihanna's stylist at the time and um, I was quite naughty and I didn't really go to my seminars. I just really handed in my coursework. And um, again, like I had parents that were just, but like you know do what you love that's always the thing that's going to take you to the places that will you know make you thrive and love life mm. um and so I was you know fully supported by the people around me by um being a bit naughty and not going to my lectures <laughs> and <laughs> and so when I um when I left uni the, the, so I did three years and I didn't I did marketing and advertising and like graphic design stuff I didn't do anything to do with fashion um, but I remember like assisting in uh, the Brit Awards and the people I assisted at the time were doing, they had like, they were styling like Lord, Rihanna, um, Tiny Temper. We had like Sam Smith, they had like five people there at one time and I just took like two or three weeks off uni just to completely throw myself into helping them um and just learned so much kind of you know doing it practically and then the week that I had in my dissertation I weirdly got like the day after I got three phone calls asking me to do some to style some music videos um and then about a month later I had to quit assisting um because I was getting my own work and so it was like I was really lucky that um, I had thrown myself into like practical learning with assisting, which is very different to obviously like being going and doing like a fashion course. Um, and yeah, and then the rest was history, and it meant I didn't have to go home because I had some rent. <laughs> I could pay my rent in London. <laughs> and it's, so it was a really like I just always say it's a kind of snowball effect. And if you once you get on that ball, you just got to keep rolling. And I just went for it, threw myself in the deep end. It was terrifying. I'd run out of student loan. I didn't have any financial help to kind of stay in London. But I think that was what actually like propelled me to just keep going um, because I knew that if. If I, you know, went home, it'd be harder for me to get back up again and mm -hmm. and get in immersed in in that whole world because the freelance world is a lot of like networking, a lot of meeting meeting people, working late at night and things like that. So, um, yeah, so it was all all down to timing really, um, and, and also. And no, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, no, it, yeah, it was. Um, I'm really, really lucky, and um, I now, I'm, I'm probably not the best example. Sometimes telling people not to go to lectures, but I do think <laughs> you've got to follow your heart, and something great will happen. And it sounds like Delara's had that kind of confidence building too from the girls' network, mm. because you need people to tell you that you know pen and paper and your grades and and you know all that stress that goes into exams isn't the real be and end all like there are lots and lots of opportunities in life that can take can can take you know take your broaden your horizons mm. and yeah take you to success sure. 
we speak about that quite a lot, don't we, Leash? About practical. Sometimes doing it is how you learn. Yeah. More so than read reading or you know that's obviously important as well. But actually getting out there and doing it is where you kind of get the gems. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, with acting, it's the same. I feel like you only learn so much if you go to uni, and then by the time you get on a film set, you've got a whole load of other learning to to do. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's it's. Uh, Every, I think it's great to go out and get experience. And I guess with Delara, that's the kind of experience you're getting with the girls' network. Have they, um, like, had someone come in or have you met anyone that, that's um, helped you into the legal field from the girls' network? Um, yeah, so I think last year, um, back in around January, um, I think I was really struggling to find some kind of experience and... Um, the girls network helped me get into contact with i think two lawyers and a judge which was amazing i had the chance to talk to them about what it's like in their field and um i learned that i think career paths aren't so straightforward sometimes like even as amy said like she had to take um chances that she didn't expect were going to come up so soon yeah, I think talking talking to people in the industry is just invaluable, isn't it? It's amazing that you can be connected with. I mean, a judge. How cool is that? You got to speak yeah, to a judge. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, how did you find Amy when you did move to London, having to network with people and stuff? How did you find your your confidence? Were you quite good at? at that side of it or were you did it take a while to kind of get used to it uh, I definitely think that I'm like naturally quite outgoing but and confident I mean I I used to do loads of dancing like I desperately wanted to be a dancer and I was actually whilst I was at uni I was also in two street dance companies um one was actually like uh, arts funded and I'm just when when Nat was talking, I was actually really thinking about my experience and how when I was in this arts funded um, dance company and how amazing and influential that was on me as like a young adult or a teenager mm. and how that develops you in so many more ways than than school can offer. Um, and so I definitely had like been given opportunities to have like growth with my confidence before coming to London because I was always I was always coming up to train every weekend um which you know like getting on a train at like 14 15 to London and doing hours of training on a Saturday um definitely helped me understand and get to know London better so it was less daunting but I look back now and think, God, I was a little, I was like so little and a little shell. And <laughs> obviously when you become an adult, you really like, you know, you, you lose a lot of your, um, your inhibitions and you just kind of you don't care as much about what people think. But I think there was definitely like at the beginning, I felt with my career, like worried that I was young and worried that my age had a... Um, was like a hindrance um, in t being taken seriously. Um, but that's all part of growing, isn't it? And <laughs> I think it's yeah, really important sure. to feel those feelings and learn from all of those feelings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of like networking and meeting people, London's big, but it's small, you know? You find your crowd, you find your places and people talk and everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's like, most people in London are here because they want to do something and achieve something. And it, it's like, that's what's so great about it. There's so many subcultures and it's, it's an amazing place to be to find your, your path. Mm hmm whatever path that is. That's what um, one of our other guests said, Judy. She was saying that coming to London is a great space for like social and networking because it's, you know, so many cultures and everyone's here just to learn and have a good time, <laughs> pretty much. 
Nat, how did you find... So you're into drama as well. Have you found that from like your experience doing drama, has that ever helped you at the girls' network? So confidence again, for example, or is, do they ever go hand in hand? Oh, uh, definitely. So when I... The way I heard about the Girls' Network, actually, I was doing some um, sex and relationship education workshops in a school in Birmingham using drama and theatre techniques because I mm. just feel really strongly there's, like, a missed, like, trick there if anyone's listening to this and has, like, the resources to, like, just roll it out, honestly, teach teach sex education using theatre will have <laughs> crack, cracked so many nuts. Um, but... Um, yeah so I was doing that and that's how I heard about the girls network um, and when I joined five years ago I was working on the ground so I was actually doing the matching of the mentors and the mentees which involves um, is an amazing role um, and it involves going to pitch the program to like you know sometimes like an assembly full of like year nine year ten like boys and girls like you know massive like audience of kids which is like can be quite um daunting um but also training our mentors so I trained I think at one point I kind of pitched a program to about 250 women at EY um so I had to do a lot of public speaking and I had to kind of um be very persuasive sometimes about the program and convince people you know so um I found it really really helped to have that background and not be afraid even just knowing how to project sometimes um in like a gym (laughs) full of young people um yeah so it really really helped me but it also kind of I I sometimes now if there's a a mentee or an ambassador who's interested in writing or theatre my colleagues know that I have a a passion and some skills there so I've been supporting it um well Precious actually who you know a little bit so we've sort of formed a relationship even though I wasn't her mentor um which has been really really nice that's really cool I think it's really cool as well like with drama like what you're saying that it just shows that it's not just if you choose drama in school it's not just to be an actor yeah or, you know there's so many opportunities that you can do from being from doing drama and like studying it just being creative is something that in any workplace um it's quite underrated I think like mm. it doing having to be in like I don't know a, a room and having to like do a piece of devised theatre or something with a bunch of people for like a day you get like you develop the skill to have ideas I think it's a skill in itself is like coming up with ideas um mm. and it's such a massive asset in any even like non you know traditionally creative spaces I'm sure that in law for example Delara well at least on tv you always see like lawyers have that light bulb moment where they find like the way around you know the case or like how to argue it I imagine like creativity in law is probably a massive asset yeah from what I've heard like it's not just about having you know good uh, summarizing skills or being able to read cases they like also when you have things that kind of make you a bit different um that creative side to you um and how you take those skills that you use perhaps elsewhere when you're I don't know, doing anything like teaching dance class or anything outside of school and how you incorporate that in your work. I mean, the arts are so helpful in like confidence, in discipline, in so many things. It's, mm. um, it's a bit like Amy, you're, you're, you were in a dance, in a dance troupe. Um, that's so great for discipline and so good for memory as well as group work same as that if you're working in theater the group work and ideas and everything I think it's just great couldn't recommend it enough to any of the listeners around even just (laughs) even down to really little things like you have to sew your laces not your laces your ribbons onto your ballet shoes and learning how to sew is so useful Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know so many people that don't know how to do it and like it's just like tiny, yeah, dis- the discipline of it, definitely. I mean, I had a really strict ballet teacher, which I just think every young girl and boy should have. It's like that aspirational figure that isn't your mum or your dad. Yeah. And some people don't have mo- aspirational mother-, mother or father figures. And like, yeah, to dra- mm-hmm. drama teachers, dance teachers, they are like the person you, you want to be when you're little, you know? Yeah. Hey, Amy, so um, we read about your 
grandfather, who was the first woman wears Taylor on Savile Row. Ooh. Is that right? So yeah. was he was he a, um, a, an inspiration for you in styling? I mean, I'd never met him. It was my great grandfather. Right. That would make sense. Yeah. I, I definitely. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, some people. Some people do. They don't. They it depends how young your parents are. Kids. True. Um, true. Uh, yeah, my. Actually, my brother, I'm one of four, and we're, like, really spread out. My brother did meet him. And my brother had a lot of, like, hand-me-down tailor tailoring pieces. So, obviously, my dad had it, and then my brother got handed it down. Um, and there was always a flair in my, in my household, especially... Um, well, yeah, especially my dad, who whose whose grandfather it was, he's always been into like quality fabric cuts, um, and I think that was ingrained in me from a young child. Um, just even the way like he would like polish his shoes, and <laughs> it's all <laughs> it's all very quite traditional and. I remember mm. we were, I was a bit older, maybe like a, a teenager, and we had to clear out the attic in my dad's, uh, my, my family home. And uh, my mum and dad had kept a lot of stuff from the 60s and 70s, and my mum used to wear like the most amazing little like Bieber boots and little like mini sailor dresses. So it's definitely like in my family that love of fashion and and kind of that cut and quality thing which I definitely affiliate with that kind of timeless and classic style but I didn't I like I didn't know when I I didn't know much about my grandfather really um and I didn't know anyone when I got into the industry because I think it can be quite like a nepotism style of an industry where you know, you have to know someone, you, you, hypothetically, you know, a lot of people think you have to know someone to get into the industry, but I didn't, but that was just like a lovely bit of history in our family, um, mm. that obviously there's a running thread there that like, it's in our blood, <laughs> that we love yeah. fashion, <laughs> and my mum's amazing at, at, at sewing, and she taught me how to knit and sew as a young girl, and so yeah, I think it obviously came from that because I definitely didn't grow up around like stereotypically like fashionable mm. parents. They loved, yeah, they've got style, but they're not, you know, they weren't like in the industry and yeah, mm -hmm. we didn't go shopping did you used all the time. To, like, <laughs> did you used to love designers when you were younger or like how did you first get into knowing about different brands? Um... I I always think I always remember like first coming to London and people like talking about designers like I don't know Comme de Garçon and I was like I don't know who all these people are like I really I really wasn't like necessarily <laughs> super clued up on it um, because I think like when you're you're when you're not in London you're not necessarily infiltrated by those subcultures I lived in the countryside but you know, you quickly catch on to it. And I, my parents always took me to like the V&A and things like that as a child. Um, but mm -hmm. I definitely knew I love fashion. I mean, I was that person at school that saved up every month to buy like the latest diesel jeans that took like a year to save up for. And by the time, by the time I bought them, they've probably <laughs> gone out of fashion. But, um, I, you know, I love clothes and, and my, we, me and my friends, like when we were like 15, we used to go up to London to go to Portobello market and raid the markets and find all these trinkets. Like definitely, I loved it, loved it, but I, I was, it wasn't necessarily something that I thought I was going to end up doing. So it's amazing how life takes you on a little journey and now I can't imagine not doing it you know I can't imagine not being completely immersed in fashion and knowing all the designers um with regards to like eco and um sustainable fashion that's becoming more of a like a common thing in in, in fashion isn't it but how like what kind of brands are there for um 
young women who don't have the money to buy these sustainable ethical brands no, that's, sometimes they're so expensive that's i think that's a real problem with there's definitely like a kind of class issue with this whole buy fewer and more quality pieces because not everyone can afford to go and buy something that's been hand knitted with 100% wool and then it's like really exp and it's a really expensive product um so i think that the rental market is amazing there's quite a few um websites there's one called by rotation there's one called her and you can rent out like jacquemus dior all the brands you can rent from these sites for like one or two days so if you have a wedding and you want to wear prada <laughs> you can wear it for like <laughs> you know a, t a fraction of the price of buying it and then you're also not just mm. sitting it on a shelf someone else has got it's got a life with someone else well, yeah that's so, so i think good. that's amazing and there's definitely a market that's really growing um but there in terms mm. of like i mean i i've just started a kids wear brand that um i'm it's called Kiso, K-I-S-O, um, and we do like little boiler suits for kids, um, and we have made them so they're like ethically and sustainably um. verified. Um, it's like trying to create this like guilt-free shopping for, for for parents because I know that it's definitely something um, that parents are, uh, parents are really aware of but the problem is is that like buying sustainably is well we shouldn't say sustainably because buying is not sustainable but um shopping responsibly is um is really expensive and that's just not achievable especially for kids because they grow so quickly um so yeah, I'm really like immersed in that, like really trying to like work out how we can make it affordable for people. Um, we definitely can't match, you know, H and M prices. But um, H and M's a whole nother conversation. I mean, there's a lot of greenwashing going on with H and M at the moment, coming out with these sustainable ranges, and I mean. You can work with 100% organic cotton, but if you're not paying people and working with fair trade, then mm. it's it needs to come under the, the same bracket, like the ethical and responsible is, you know, the planet and humans are all one, you know, we need to look after both of them. Um, but yeah, so that's my tip. It's definitely the rental market's amazing. And I think it probably has been really tough for a lot of rental places because they would... They were predicted to really boom this summer, last summer. Um, but obviously with COVID, like all the weddings and things like that were cancelled. And I think a lot of people wouldn't have had a chance to rent. You know, you might not want to rent leggings because you wear them every day. It doesn't really make sense. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, with dresses and, and, um, and it's brilliant because they have, you know all sizes available and yeah it's really um it's really inclusive cool. for i'm gonna check for everyone out. it's brilliant yeah yeah and how yeah. often do you really wear like the same thing i mean to a wedding yeah, definitely you want to switch it up don't yeah. you yeah yeah or i guess yeah, to any kind of special occasion or like for your birthday you want to feel special and buy something new but you can rent something new um Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's brilliant. So, Amy, just hearing you talk, it seems like you have a lot of passion for what you do. And also, I've seen some of your work on social media, and it's incredible. Um, <laughs> and also, you know, working on a lot of projects, I'm sure there must have been many highlights of your career. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about a few. Yeah. Um, okay, highlights. I would say I worked with... God, this is hard because I love my job and there are so many moments. Um, 
there's a few that stick out in my mind. I might do them in date order. So when I was assisting, we did, I don't know if you um, saw it, but Rihanna did The X Factor and we, what song? It was Only Girl in the World. Do you remember that song, Dolara? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. And she did, um, she had like a Marie Antoinette style tea party on stage. Um, and we'd done a rehearsal and all was, all was fine. Everyone was like pretending to throw cake at each other in the rehearsal. And then the real thing, and obviously the X Factor is live, bear that in mind. The real mm-hmm. thing, um, the art director had made cakes with le- that were like that much cake and about that much icing. <laughs> and it was like sparkly, sparkly icing. And everyone was just throwing it at each other. And so much so that the stage was so slippy and everyone was totally covered in icing that when they came oh off stage all of the backstage was just covered in icing and we were, it was really, um. we spent hours like washing off the clothes and then obviously they only have like the break to clean up but it was like buttery sugary slippy icing so we were all trying to like mop oh, no. the stage yeah <laughs> That, so yeah, that was amazing. Um, that was so. That was a definitely like a highlight of when I was assisting, because um, it was just so. Live TV is just amazing. It's mad, but amazing. Um, so that was fun. And then I did um, Sally Hawkins for the Oscars. I don't know if you know her, but she was in Blue Jasmine with Kate Blanchett. She's the mum in Paddington. Um, she oh, yeah. was right. she was the woman in Shape of Water was nominated for an Oscar yeah. for that. So I did Sally. I worked with Sally for like lots of things, but I did Sally for the Oscars when she was nominated for um, Blue Blue um, Blue Jasmine with Kate Blanchett. And we did a um, we worked with Valentino <coughs> as uh, we had an exclusive with Valentino, and she wore this. Embroidered like pearl and gold um, thread encrusted dress, which was absolutely breathtaking. And um, we had like the Valentino kind of head tailor flown over from the headquarters in Milan, I think it was Milan. Um, and she then she came to London to fit it, and then she also met us in LA to do a last fitting and it was very special and then she and then Sally turned up at the Oscars and Kate Blanchett was wearing something in the same like tone like kind of pearly pinky tone and like the two of them <laughs> together because they were obviously there they were like um she was supporting actress and Kate was lead actress and they were both nom- nominated together for the same film but they both just looked amazing together in all of the pictures <laughs> it was really special so that that was an amazing moment. Um, gosh, there's so many. I mean, I remember dressing like 300 people on stage for the EMAs, which was pretty incredible. Um, wow. Having a huge team, and that was for like Clean Bandit had a song with Sarah Larson and Anne Marie and like loads of people. Um, but yeah, I miss all of those like live. TV moments because there's so much adrenaline (laughs) just like Mm. nothing can go wrong um yeah and lots of people also in one room it's probably not going to happen for a while so yeah I could literally carry on giving you moments but you'll probably get bored amazing (laughs) yeah Delara do you think that um when you become a lawyer and a really good one at that are you gonna use fashion as as your like standout? You know, like how people have like <laughs> proper um, strong female suits. Um, but you know what? I've always loved those um, types of outfits. I like how it looks so professional, but also looks so nice at the same time. Um, yeah, like a Mal, that. like a Mal Clooney. She always is mm, amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, she is a lawyer, Beautiful isn't she? Outfits. She's a human mm. rights lawyer. Yeah, she's had like fought some of the most amazing cases of our generation. I'd say. 
What made you first want to get into law, Delara? Um, well, initially I was going to go into science, um, but then, I don't know, as I was just growing up, I just, that wasn't the thing I wanted anymore. Um, and then I started leaning more mm -hmm. towards languages and English. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I like that kind of creativity. Um, I like using my words and things like that. And mm. um, so, yeah, I found out about law. And then I found out also I could do law with languages. So it just seemed perfect for me. How many languages can you speak? Um, oh. I, aside from English, I'm learning uh, Spanish and French. Very good. That's amazing. <laughs> I would love to be bilingual, but I've, I've never, uh, I, I just can't do it. I've tried <laughs> so, so hard. <laughs> Not do hard. you guys speak yeah. languages? Or any other languages? I speak Welsh. Oh, wow. Well, okay. That's really cool. <laughs> That's mm. so cool. Yeah, it's it's funny. I think like a lot of people don't realise in North Wales it's very very Welsh speaking because I think when you go to Cardiff, it isn't really like it's quite English. You wouldn't really think that it has that population, but North Wales is quite a big Welsh speaking population. It's very Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, that's why it always reminds me of that kind of like mystical, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> magical, otherworldly. <laughs> So you got your own secret club. Yeah, yeah. I, love I think it. me and my sister are the only people in London that speak Welsh. It feels. I'm sure there's loads <laughs> more out there, but sometimes on the tube we can just, you know, have a little conversation if we want to. If we want to say something. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. That's so good. Oh you gosh, should go I down the road, like speaking it, and see if anybody catches on. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it? I think people. It's it's quite Celtic, very like Gaelic y kind of But that's cool, Dilara, that you can you're you're learning that because then you can, you know, if you if you have those languages in the bag, you can go anywhere really to well, anywhere that speaks yeah. French or Spanish yeah. to to be able to like do your job there. Mm, that's what I'd like to do. That's amazing. It's always such a bonus to have more than one language in, in anything, I think. It's mm. such a a brilliant um, skill to have. Definitely, mm. yeah. Amy, I wanted to ask you about um, working and being busy and having to look after children at the same time. Mm, yeah. At the same time. Well, that's like w proper woman waves question, isn't it? That's yeah. a proper woman <laughs> waves question. <laughs> Such a good one. <laughs> um, well, when I decided to be a stylist, I wasn't thinking about <laughs> how that would work, you know, when I become a mum. I've always wanted to be a mum. So I feel very lucky that actually it, it's a career that I can, you know, fit around. Not always. I can't always fit things around because, you know, actors have very busy lives and busy schedules so I need to be the flexible one that can kind of slot in mm -hmm. um but having said that you know if I want to take my kid to the beach or whatever on a sunny day I can be I'm my own boss so I can kind of catch up with my work in the evening when she's gone to sleep and things like that so I feel really grateful that I'm my own boss in that sense and I don't have to be in the office every day by a certain time and like, mm -hmm. you know if it's a nice sunny day I go pick her up from nursery early and we have a picnic and whereas I have friends yeah, that smile. have more it's serious so real jobs that can't necessarily do that <laughs> so yeah. I'm really grateful and I can't complain but it is hard it is hard to mm. try and um navigate it and make sure that you are as present as you can be whilst also being this like figurehead where they can learn and I've always said like I I really I want to work because I want to be able to tell my daughter stories and my mum and dad taught me work ethic because I saw how hard they work yeah. and I think it's the most amazing Thing, one of the most amazing qualities in people is when they 
just have this natural instinct to work hard. Um, and that's just deeply rooted, isn't it? You can't really teach that. Do you get to try on your uh, your brand's clothes on uh, I tell well, I tell you what, recently I moved my office home. I'm in my office now. I'm not gonna I normally give you a tour, but it is <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a sneak peek. There's boxes everywhere because <laughs> I've had a really busy big week um but uh my so I, I normally I've had like an office um not at home for like 10 years now and I recently because of covid actually interestingly enough my old flat my old office um apple tv hired it out for a new film and so we had oh. to move out anyway. And then I just decided that with lockdown, just to hand in my notice and, and not go back because it was around, yeah, it was around the second lockdown that I was like, do you know what? I think I'll, I think I'll bring it home. So anyway, cut long story short, my office is at home now, which is, took a bit of getting used to because um, just not been used to having boxes mm. everywhere in my house for a while. But anyway, um, I'm very fortunate that we've got a spare room, so everything's in there at the moment, but my daughter is obsessed <laughs> with this room. She just comes up and tries on all the shoes, and she's mm -hmm. only two and a half, so like, I'll send you some pictures <laughs> later. Oh. Got these like really high um, purple boots, like shiny purple snakeskin boots, boots, and she puts <laughs> oh them on God. and she goes like, Hey, cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll go like, Mommy, give me my handbag. She'll like throw her hand back and be like, give me my handbag. It's really, Aww. probably, probably quite dangerous. <laughs> it's probably quite dangerous. I'm just imagining when she's like going, starts going to like balls or not balls, proms mm -hmm. yeah. or parties and she starts nicking stuff out of my office. And I'm like, where, where did that go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's like ripped, and I can't give it back to the designer. I'm gonna have to put like a, a padlock on the you door. Have to yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, this is. I'm hoping my office won't be at home for much longer. Well, this is just an interim, but um, yeah, I definitely. It is quite scary when you see a two and a half year old in heels. <laughs> I bet. I do. Not sure it's so good for her brain. <laughs> mm. Well, we, we all do it. We've all done it, haven't we? Yeah, but I feel yes. like I, I feel like it was more like you know those plastic Barbie shoes. Yeah, with a fluff on them, with their with their <laughs> feathers. Yeah, <laughs> not like Jimmy Choo's or Le Boutons. <laughs> True. Yeah, she's gonna have expensive taste. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm saying it's dangerous for me more than her. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's um, I don't, I don't tend to. You ask me if I tried things on and borrowed them I don't I don't tend to I don't think I did at the beginning but not anymore um I'm yeah I'm quite a creature of habit I know what I like I know what looks good on me and I kind of wear the same four outfits in rotation um love it yeah which I guess is quite what Amy will be getting you what know what you're coming for Amy's <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> I always think like Steve Jobs was known for wearing the same outfit every day. True. Yeah. True. Uh, there was they, he said something like it's because it would just take time out of his day of thinking mm. of something that mm. felt unnecessary to him. Yeah, I think Which, he had the same like outfit on hangers for each day, and it was like he doesn't need to think about it, so he can spend more time like taking over the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I can it just imagine so much like, sense, you know, in a cartoon. Isn't it? And they've got the whole yeah. wardrobe that's all the same. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah. all the same. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to anyone listening that is thinking of joining the Girls Network? I would say definitely go for it because even when you join... I don't think you realise just how much you'll benefit from it at the end. Um, you know, it's not one of those things that you go through the programme and that's it, it's done. You have, I don't know, a whole... Um, 
you have more support on your journey that you can go you can go to them at any time honestly they're so friendly um yeah they're they're amazing women um and yeah uh, it would help a lot with confidence and it'll help you grow as a person they're doing some wicked stuff like i don't know if you've heard about it delara but um some some of the girls are working with the police at the moment um mentoring them over uh off, which is which is pretty cool trying mm. to help them after the um what happened with sarah everard they're mm. now talking to uh police about their experiences in the community mm. and which yeah i think that's very amazing. important mm. I didn't know if you got involved or anything. Um, Um, I knew they held an event with the women on the police force. Um, I attended that one. And, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think even then um, the women on the police force were giving a lot of kind of help and chances to kind of go down that path. Um, And, yeah, it it seemed great. What advice would you give for any aspiring creatives or any females um, for the future? I think I touched on it earlier, but do what you love and do what makes you happy because your job takes up, you know, like 80% of your life. And if you love something, you can go places with it because you just want to drive and keep going and keep going and climbing that ladder. And so, yeah, do what you love. Always make sure that your voice is heard. Um, I learned quite quickly that when I was assisting that people that didn't necessarily say their name or name themselves known in the room didn't have as many chances to come back again you need to make a stamp on people you need to make people remember you and for the right reasons obviously you don't want to you don't want to be too (laughs) you don't want to talk too much um (laughs) but know know when the right time is to talk and engage with people and tell the universe the people you're around you know what you want from life and people like people want to help you know people want to bring bring you up and see success it's amazing like I've worked now with um I've had three assistants um and one my first assistant ever was with me for like five years she was a bridesmaid at my wedding she's like my little sister and she's now massively successful stylist and um I'm so proud of her and, and, you know, it was all to do with, like, I couldn't have done my job without her and she learned enough for her to go on and, and be a mega boss and it's just amazing, I love, I love it, I love seeing it and so I just think, you know, women need to help other women and we're all in it together. And Delara? Um, so I'd say, well, this applies to, I guess, any stage of your life but don't doubt yourself as much honestly because um i think even even in school um you know we talk about how usually when the girls give their answers they're a lot more uncertain even though you know there's intelligent as anyone else in the class and they kind of hesitate a bit more um uh, so I think it's so important to have that confidence on you um, so that you can just, you know, keep making your, keep um, going down the path that you want and, mm. you know, it will help you a lot in the long term. So true. Thank you so much for coming on to Woman Waves. It was amazing having you on and uh, it was just like a massive hug this Friday. So it's lovely to to see you all and hear about your amazing experiences. Um, But hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Have a lovely day at the seaside tomorrow. (laughs) Oh yeah, I can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) 